Good morning, everyone. Um, we are continuing with uh, statistical uh, mechanics of uh, microcanonical ensembles. And um, just to remind you, the last lecture for the Einstein model, eventually we've got this formula for the uh, energy of the system, the average energy of the system. I was 3n, n is the number of particles in the solid, 3 because we are using three-dimensional uh, system. H bar omega zero, it's a quanta, single quantum of energy. And here was this uh, factor that actually we obtained from counting all the states and expanding the entropy uh, using the Stirling approximation. It went something like E h bar omega zero divided by k volts per t minus one. And uh, what I told you is that if we look on this guy, Cv, which is simply the derivative of du with respect to the temperature, okay, we obtain the following function. So we're looking at the function of temperature on this specific heat. What we will obtain is that for small temperatures, the specific heat goes to zero. Okay. And it increases as a function of temperature. And eventually, Cv saturates at a specific value. You can say it's a Cv divided by 3 and it's a value which depends only on omega zero and h bar. Okay, it will be divided by 3n. Now, how are we getting it? We just need to take a derivative of this function, and this is what we obtain. And this is a success and the failure of the Einstein model for solids. What is a success? So this part over here, the saturation part, when the specific heat is basically becoming a constant, is something that one can see in the experiment. And um, now we also can understand what's going on. So at some point, as we increase our temperature, the particles occupy higher and higher energetic states. Right? Because remember, we are dealing here with three-dimensional oscillators, or 3M simple oscillators. Those oscillators are absolutely uncoupled. And if you look on the energy, En, which was equals to n h bar omega zero, we see that the spectrum basically becomes the energy. If we look on the spectrum up above by increasing the temperature, we almost do not see those little gaps between different energies. Okay? In, in a sense, there is a gaps, there are gaps for each single oscillator. Each single oscillator can have this quantized energy. But all of them together, the differences between different energies, as temperature is becoming larger and larger, become smaller and smaller. We almost do not see any difference in the increase of the energy or the increase in the energy with the increase in temperature is proportional. Okay? It's not, if we're looking over here at very low temperature, we're at the energy, the base energy, which is zero. We increase our temperature a little bit and the system jumps, suddenly jumps, to the next level, next x excited level, which is h bar omega zero. If you're looking only on one single oscillator. So there is a very sudden increase happening over here that occurs for the low temperatures. But after we perform this procedure again and again for the higher temperatures, when the particles are occupying very high energetic levels, okay, this derivative of u with respect to t is not behaving weirdly or not behaving very, very fast. It's actually a constant. 
And this is what one sees in, a, in, in experiments. And this is clear because at some point, when we heat the system for enough or high enough temperatures, the different particles stop caring about each other. Although they are still in the solid, but they just vibrating violently in any direction, and they completely don't care about what's going on. And this is the stage of uh, the constant uh, <coughs> specific heat. This is what, where Einstein was successful. It, it's like a gas in this state. What's going over here? What's going on over here? So, in the experiment, the specific heat goes to zero, okay, as the temperature is lower enough. Okay, so basically, why? Because again, for very low temperatures, if we increase the temperature a little bit, it's not sufficient in order to excite the particle to the next energetic level. It will still be occupying the lowest level possible. So the specific heat go, must go to zero for very, very low temperatures. I increase my temperature, but the, but the particles are not getting enough of this temperature, enough energy excitation in order to jump to the next level. They're still sitting in the lowest, lowest level possible, and this is why the specific heat is not changing. It goes to zero over here, too. Okay, this derivative is basically zero. <coughs> so, the saturation is well explained by the Einstein model. The fact that the specific heat goes to zero is explained by the Einstein model. The problem was how this model is actually approaching zero. Okay? So the specific functional form that is predicted by the Einstein model, the derivative of this energy, is not behaving as the decay that one sees in the experiment. Uh, and why is that? Because actually for low enough temperatures, and I think we mentioned it in our previous lecture, the correlations between different motions of different particles become very, very important. We cannot simply neglect them and say, this is a particle, this is a particle in a solid, and they vibrate without any coordination with their neighbors. It's simply not true for low enough temperatures. They will perform something like that, right? So, and this is why the behavior of the Einstein model does not fit the experimental observation, functionally not fit. Simply because it's neglected all kind of correlations, and we know, now we know, that for low enough temperatures, we cannot do this. At the time of the Einstein model, we're talking about 1907, this, is, this observation is quite important. Because think about it. It's the time of the Rutherford experiments. People start to understand how matter is actually, what is the, the basic <coughs> bricks of the matter. And now they start to understand that actually, if we assume that there is a lot of bricks, and those bricks are, do not correlate with each other, if you think something like that, it's simply not true because otherwise the Einstein model will work. We know it does not work, and something is different in, our, in, in this model, in this, uh, in this structure. And what they later came to understand, based on the, something that is called the Bayer model, we will learn it later, you need to include those correlations between different atoms in different particles. Okay, so this was the Einstein model repeated this part again. Um, let us start with another simple model that uses a microcanonical ensemble. Uh, and it's even more simpler than the Einstein model, and it's named the two-state model. Okay. So what is a two-state model? So I have n particles, number of particles. So zero, each particle, has two energies. Zero and epsilon, and epsilon is greater than zero. Okay. Now, how I explain it physically, that I have two particles that have, or I have particle with only two state with only two energies. Well, basically the physical situation is if this is my energetic spectrum, okay, 
if I'm looking on the lowest possible eigen energies of the particle, so there is this zero, and there is this epsilon, okay? And somewhere over here, with a big gap between those two nearby energies, there is another, there are additional energies, but they lie up above over there, okay? So I have a very big gap between the epsilon eigenenergy and all the other energies over there. And basically what I'm saying is, let's forget about them for now. We're only looking on the two lower lowest energies, and that's all. Okay. Now, I want to ask the following question. What is the number of states for the system? And because the moment I know the number of states of the system, I'm using microcanonical ensemble, I can obtain the entropy of the system. And the moment I have the entropy of the system, I can define the temperature. Right. And again, obtain definition of the energy of the system with respect to the temperature, with some values, known values of the system, and the number of particles. I can obtain the equation of state. Now, this is a microcanonical ensemble, and we chose not to include volume over here. We will have n as the size of the system, but we don't have any connection to the volume or pressure or stuff like that. Okay, so let's start how we compute the number of states. Okay. We basically count. It's a microcanonical example and sample, so we must count. So U is the energy of the system. Then u divided by epsilon, u divided by epsilon, is the number of particles with energy epsilon, right? Okay. Because each particle can have either zero or epsilon, so if I have for example, n prime, n prime number of particles that are having energy epsilon, the total energy u is simply n prime multiplied by epsilon, so n prime the number of particles, <coughs> I'm sorry, that are uh, occupying energy energetic level epsilon are, is simply u divided by epsilon. Okay. Um, then we have n minus u divided by epsilon is the number the number of particles with energy zero. All right. This is actually enough in order to say what is the number of states or in the system. How we do it? We have in total n particles. And we are asking ourselves what is the number of states or what is the number of ways to choose from this n particles u divided by epsilon particles that have energy epsilon. So to put them in a box that we call epsilon. And to put the remainder, the n minus u divided by epsilon, to the box which is called zero energy. Okay. So the number of states is a simple binomial formula. It's n factorial divided by u divided by epsilon factorial. And here I have n minus u divided by epsilon factorial. It's a counting problem. This is the number of ways that I actually can choose from the n particles and u divided by epsilon to put in a box, n minus u divided by epsilon not to put in a box, and I don't really care about the order of how I put them in the box. <coughs> okay, so we continue on, and we have that the entropy is simply K Boltzmann log of n 
n factorial divided by u divided by epsilon factorial. And here I have n minus u divided by epsilon factorial. Okay. This is my entry. What is my next step? Staring approximation. I'm using the fact that n is large. I expand this logarithm over here. Okay, so what is this logarithm? Let's write s divided by k Boltzmann equals to n log n. I use sharing over here. n log n minus n minus u divided by epsilon log u divided by epsilon. I will have over here plus u divided by epsilon. Right? I will have another minus n minus u divided by epsilon log of n minus u divided by epsilon and the plus of n minus u divided by epsilon. Okay. So this is my entropy divided by k Boltzmann. Um, in the same fashion as we did it last week, okay, we now can get rid of some of the terms. So what terms we are getting rid of? We have, look, so we have here n minus n, we have here plus n, so this guy we can get rid of, right? Still we have plus u divided by epsilon, we have here minus u divided by epsilon, Um, anything else that is left? Basically, no. Right? So what we are left with equals to n log n minus u divided by epsilon log u divided by epsilon minus n minus u divided by epsilon log n minus u divided by epsilon. Okay, this is our s. Okay. We can continue this and actually bring to some nicer form in the same fashion as we did it previously. Right? But we don't really use need it. Why we don't need it? Because what we are interested in, we're interested in the following formula. 1 over t equals to ds to du. Okay. We take a derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy, right? and we obtain the 1 over t temperature. Now, when I'm doing this stuff, first of all, see that this term I completely don't care of. And the only thing that is actually matters is this term and this term over here. Okay. So let's take the derivatives of the two terms. Any questions so far? This is the standard procedure. It's always the moment one can get this formula over here, and this is actually the harder part. Okay? This is only, we are capable of doing it only for very simple systems, like the Einstein model, the two-state. There is an additional example, but there is not a lot of examples that one can count the number of states. Uh, afterwards, you just take a lot of derivatives, and that's it. Okay, so um, this is why the microcanonical ensemble is actually boring. It's not really interesting. And it's tough because no one, no one likes to do a very cumbersome combinatorics and afterwards take long derivatives. Okay, so we're taking the derivative. Let's look on this guy over here. So 1 over t equals 2 minus k Boltzmann multiplied by 1 over epsilon log of u divided by epsilon. Right? I take the derivative of this guy. I also have over here minus u divided by epsilon. Uh, let's take this guy over here. 
1 over kilovolts from T. Um, U divided by epsilon multiplied by 1 over U divided by epsilon multiplied by 1 over epsilon. Okay, so this is the derivative of this guy. Okay, now let's take the derivative of this guy. We have plus 1 over epsilon log of n minus u divided by epsilon. Okay, I took the derivative of only this part over here. Okay, and here we have minus n minus u divided by epsilon, 1 over n minus u divided by epsilon, okay, multiplied by minus 1 over epsilon. Okay, um, let's try and make some sense out of it. So 1 over k Boltzmann t equals to minus 1 over epsilon log of u divided by epsilon. Here I have u divided by epsilon multiplied by 1 over u divided by epsilon. So it's 1. And I have here minus 1 over epsilon. Okay. 1 over epsilon. Here I have plus 1 over epsilon log of n minus u divided by epsilon. Okay. And here I have n minus u divided by n minus u divided by epsilon, so this guy disappears, and I have minus 1, minus 1, and I have plus 1 divided by epsilon. So this guy and this guy, they disappear altogether. Uh, and I obtain the following equation. The equation is um, epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t equals to log of n minus u divided by epsilon divided by u divided by epsilon. Okay. I'm taking a log, or I'm sorry, exponent of this term and this term. And I arrive to the following equation, which is an exponent of epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t equals to n minus u divided by epsilon divided by u divided by epsilon. All right. Um, so we multiply both sides by u divided by epsilon. We transform into another side. And we have u divided by epsilon e to the epsilon k Boltzmann t plus 1 equals N, and we obtain that u equals to n multiplied by epsilon divided by 1 plus e epsilon k Boltzmann p. Okay. Nice. So we can obtain exactly as in the Einstein model, like here it's a little bit simpler. Um, it's the same thing, the same way. We can obtain the definition of the energy. And now we can go and say what is what is the specific heat? Okay. So it's again it's du divided by dt. Okay. We can take this derivative. We can take this derivative and we say see that it's c equals to n multiplied by epsilon divided by 1 plus e epsilon k Boltzmann t squared, okay, multiplied by, I'm sorry, with minus 1, minus, multiplied by e epsilon k Boltzmann t multiplied by epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t squared, minus 1. Okay. So this is the derivative. Minus 1 and minus 1. They disappear. And eventually we obtain um, the following equation. 
we obtain that c equals n epsilon squared divided by k Boltzmann t squared multiplied by e to the epsilon k Boltzmann t divided by 1 plus epsilon a e to the power epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t everything here is square okay. so this is the final result now you remember that I told you that the specific heat for the Einstein model had two features it was going to zero for low temperatures and it was saturating for high enough temperatures and we explained this fact simply that for very low temperatures the temperature is not sufficient in order to change the energy of the system because the particles are still at their lowest energy and at the highest temperatures where we increase the temperature a little bit and the energy is proportional to this increase of energy because the spectrum is almost continuous okay? they don't care, the particles completely don't care about each other what happens over here? So let's analyze the two regimes. Okay, we can draw over here as a function of temperature. We will drive C divided by N. Okay. This is our two terms. Okay, so what happens in this system when the temperature is, is going to zero? So the temperature is going to zero, this guy explodes. Okay, it's simply diverges. It diverges in what way? Polynomially. It goes as t to the power minus 2. Let's look on this term. So when t is going to 0, this guy is diverging. What happens to this guy when t is going to 0? This guy is diverging. So we have a divergence from this guy, and we have a divergence from this guy. But this guy is also diverging. So 1 over this guy, okay, 1 over this guy is going to 0. This is an exponential, or this is exponential, no exponential, polynomial divergence. This part over here is diverged exponentially. This guy over here it's, diver it's diverged as exponentially to the power of e divided by k Boltzmann t multiplied by 2. Okay, let's write it down. So for t goes to 0, the first guy is simply t to the minus 2. The second is e to the epsilon by k Boltzmann t. The third is e to the 2 epsilon k Boltzmann t. Why I forgot about the 1? Because the 1 is insufficient. It's, it's simply 1. This guy, when t is going to 0, explodes. So we can forget about the 1 over here. Okay. So we can forget about this term and forget about the 2 over here. And when t goes to 0, we need to look on the ratio of those two guys. So here, t to the minus 2, it's, it's diverged uh, polynomially. This guy over here, it's also diverged, but it's diverged exponentially. The, the exponential divergence is much, much, much faster uh, than the polynomial divergence. So everything is controlled by what happens to this term. So 1 over something that's diverging is actually going to 0. And this is exactly what we expect. So c divided by n going to zero and then so this guy goes to zero and then it's CV cannot be negative and then it rises up again okay what happens when T goes to infinity so when T goes to infinity again this is T to the power minus two okay so it's a decaying function at least this leading term over here when t goes to infinity, it's e to the power of 0. So this one goes to a number, constant number 1. Here, the same happens. t goes to infinity, 
this goes to 1, so it's 1 plus 1 to the power 2. I completely don't care. The T dependence dies off. So the only dependence on the temperature for high enough temperatures is from the prefactor over here. And it's 1 over T squared. So again, in this region, it also goes to 0. Okay. Now, one also can show that there is only one single maxima in between, and the CV for this system looks like this. Okay? This hump is called a Schottky hump. Why it's important? Beyond the the just actually serving as an example to uh, how one solve microcanonical uh, uh, model. Basically, what this picture means. So if you look on the system, okay, if you look on the system, uh, and this is what we observe. So we observe that the specific heat is increasing as a function of the temperature. It has a maxima and then it decays. Okay. First of all, we can now say, well, maybe it's actually similar to the two-state system, two-state model that we analyzed in class. Okay? Now, why? So this behavior, it's clear, it's exactly as in the Einstein model. Nobody is occupying any higher energies, any energies of, of uh, size epsilon, when the temperature is very, very low. Everybody sits in their most lowest energy levels at zero. And we increase the energy, and we increase the temperature, and nothing happens. But why here it goes to zero? So in the Einstein model, we say we go to the high temperatures, the particles completely don't care about each other, right? And then the increase in the en uh, is energy is proportional to the increase in the temperature. But here it goes to zero. So we increase the temperature more and more and more, and the energy is not increasing. Why happening? Remember what we had over in the, in this, in the model. If you look on the energies, En, there is a zero energy. There is additional level, which is the epsilon level. And there is nothing up here in the model at least. There is nothing up here. So we increase the energy, or we increase the temperature, and those particles, they cannot jump to the next level because there is no other levels. This means I increase my temperature, and there is no increase in the energy. This is why the specific heat has to go down, right? What will happen, actually, if I will continue to increase the, the, the temperature? In a real system. In a real system, after a while, it will, get to the higher, uh, yeah. it will start to rise again. Because somewhere over here, there are additional levels. So if I increase the temperature even more, at some point, at some temperature, I'm sorry, not some point. At some temperature, there will start to become there will be particles that will rise to the next level, to the next energetic level. I need to get there, and sometimes it will make me huge invest in the temperature in heating up the system. But eventually, we will, we will get there. Then this Schottky hump is actually important because what it says it says that you are in the range of temperatures where there are an effectively small numbers of energetic levels, and you still haven't reached this, this uh, the, and there is a big gap, energetic gap, between the levels that you are observing and the higher levels. And an existence of a gap in a physical system, an energetic gap, is something very important. It's important in semiconductors and other quant, uh, quantum uh, mechanisms. So the, the observation that I have a gap in my system is important. Basically, this is what Schott Kiham tells us. We have a huge gap somewhere over there. All right. Any questions about the two-state model? No. So we will continue to the third model uh, and the final model for the microcanonical example. And this one is called a polymer model. As I said, there's not a lot of models in microcanonical ensemble that one can solve. 
mainly because the combinatorics of counting states becomes almost impossible for real systems. So we always need to, when we define a model, keeping the microcanonical ensemble, we always must keep ourselves in the limits that the mathematics, the combinatorics mainly, won't become too harsh. Um, so it's exactly the same as previously in this polymer model. We want to define energetic states, we want to define particles, here we will call them monomers, that do not interact with each other. There is not a lot of constraints. Why? Because the moment we've increased, we include interaction in microcanonical ensemble, it starts hard to count everything. We are capable of counting states because look on the two systems that we dealt before. We said eventually we have a box, or two boxes, or three boxes, and we have other particles, and what is the number of ways to actually put those particles in those boxes? This is what we mostly can do. The moment that I start to think about, well, the number on this box and the number in that box must be correlated, and there are two particles that must be exactly in the same box, it's hard to count. So uh, when I define a model using a microcanonical, it's not the same in canonical ensemble or grand canonical. But in microcanonical, it's, it's very harsh because I'm counting everything. So when I'm trying to define a model using a microcanonical ensemble, I almost must forget about any interactions. Okay. So a polymer, physically, it's a long molecule. It's uh, composed of something like this, and it's composed of small molecules that we call monomers, okay? And there is some interactions between those monomers, generally. The physics of polymers is a wonderful subject, very, very, very tough, and uh, since those polymers are used a lot in the industry, uh, for example, for producing gels, those long, mo long molecules, uh, there was a huge invest in the physics of this polymers, etc., etc. Uh, for example, diapers. Diapers are composed from polymer gels. Basically, those long mole molecules, they, they are absorbing water or preventing the water from actually flowing around. Um, for our model, what will we think that the polymer is a stream composed of small substrings, let's call them, that we call monomers. Now, those monomers, in reality, they somehow correlated with each other. So, if I have a small molecule over here, the orientation of the next one should be correlated with the orientation of the previous. So, this direction of this guy over here should be somehow affecting the direction of this guy over here and should somehow detect or define the direction of this guy over here. For example, the xy direction, how it's oriented. Uh, if you think on the, of the monomers, of small arrows. Um, in physics, it's called a persistent length. Okay? So how one guy over here dictates the other guy over there. Uh, and this persistence length, in physics, it's not zero. There is models, and we can actually uh, observe in experiments how those, this persistent lens is actually behaves. For our model, we do not want to include any correlations. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, I will have monomers, those monomers are my particles, and this monomer over here is completely uncorrelated with this monomer over there and this monomer over here. Basically, I'm saying my persistence lens is zero. There are no correlations between different particles. So this is assumption number one. It simplifies the problem. Really, really simplifies the problem. Okay. Now, assumption number two is the energy of this guy is completely will be is completely uncorrelated to the energy of this guy, completely uncorrelated to the energy of that guy. So the energies are completely uncorrelated. The total energy must be constant. So this is the constraint that somehow connects the different energies. But when I'm looking on the energy of this one and that one, they shouldn't care about each other. So this is assumption number two. Assumption number three, I'm saying, 
we are looking on the two-dimensional model. So each monomer can have only four possible directions. It can point to the right, it can point to the left, it can point up, and it can point down. Okay? So basically I'm saying I don't have a monomer that's going in that direction. Right? So this is allowed. This is not allowed. See, this is a process of building a physical model. I cannot start with something very complicated because I won't get anywhere. I want to start with something simple enough that then I can actually compute something and hopefully I'll get something important or sufficiently uh, knowledgeable. Okay? But if I would try to solve this problem absolutely including everything, I'm doomed because it's impossible. So we are in the microcanonical ensemble. We're assuming that the total energy is fixed. Okay. And I'm saying that the total energy of the system is U. Okay. And I'm saying the following thing is that if I'm looking on a single monomers, it can have and can be in four different states. As before, the particle could be in two states. Now I'm saying each monomer can be in four states. Okay? But, but, the energy of this guy, I say, it's zero energy. So if the own monomer is pointing to the right, the energy of this state is zero. If the monomer is pointing to the left, the energy is zero. If the monomer is pointing up, the energy is epsilon. If the monomer is pointing down, the, monomer, the energy is epsilon. How I define myself the system and why I chose exactly those 0, 0, epsilon, and epsilon? Okay. Well, let's think that I have a wall over here. Okay. And I have a pulley over here with a string attached and some mass over here. Okay. We can think that we start exactly from the same height. Not the same height. Um, as this pool over here. And our polymer can go in different directions. This is my polymer. It's a very crude approximation. Okay. And here it's connected to a string. But now at least I understand why I have energy of zero for this or that direction, because the string is pulling, pulling to the right, so this direction is the right direction, because when the monomer is exactly in the direction of the string, it does not have to pay any additional energy to actually oppose it. Okay? But when I'm actually in the direction which is perpendicular to the application of the force, I have to pay some energy in order to be there. Right. This is the reasoning why saying here it's epsilon and here it's minus epsilon. I can start and complicate these things, right? I can say, well, maybe going upwards is epsilon plus something and going downwards is epsilon minus something. And maybe I can have now different states that will depend on my angle. It won't bring anything new. Okay? This actually is a very minimal model and it's enough to a, solve it on the board really quickly. And obtain something important about, <coughs> about measurable uh, properties. For example, the elastic modulus. What is an elastic modulus? So in this system, I can actually control the force with which I'm pulling this polymer. Okay? Think about as a string. All of this guy over here, all together, they construct a big polymer. And I can think of this big polymer as an effective string. So I'm trying and pulling this string to the right and it starts to expand. Okay? There is an elastic theory for expansion. 
The elastic theory states that if I am increasing the temperature of the spring, of the material, for a, re a regular spring, the, the higher the temperature, the easier it for me to actually pull the string to the right. Okay? Because the elastic modulus is actually, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, elastic modulus is growing with the temperature. We will see that for a molar polymer, it's not true. I can go to the, to the, to the lab. You can go here to Yuval's Guruni lab, for example. You can take one single polymer, attach a bead to this one polymer, and try and actually drag it in one specific direction. You can apply a specific force. It won't be a rectangular polymer, it will be a regular polymer, something like this. But you can measure the force, you can measure this elastic modulus, you can change the temperature, and you will see that as you increase the temperature, okay, it becomes harder and harder for you to pull the polymer. So it's not a regular spring, although it connects for a lot of elastic small springs. The more you pull, or the more, the, more you, the more you increase the temperature and you try to pull, the harder it becomes. Okay. And what I claim is that we can obtain exactly the same behavior for this elastic modulus from a very simplistic approximation for the polymer. Okay. And I, at the end, we will understand exactly why it happened. It's not because of the different forces, it's because of the entropy. The entropy and, this, and the thing that we allow the polymer to move in 2D plane is actually what makes things complicated. So let's see, let's see how we start with this model and obtain this property of elastic modulus that is going down with the increase of the temperature. We still have time. Okay, so what do we know, what do we want to know about this guy, what we assume? Remember, it's a microcanonical micro ensemble. We need to count states, okay? The states of the system. So, what we already know, we already know that n number of monomers. Okay. We also know, we also know that n x plus we know, or we assume that we know, is the number of monomers in x direction. <coughs> Let's say this is x, this is i. And x minus is number of monomers in minus x direction and y plus is the number of monomers in y direction and n y minus is the number of monomers in minus y direction So when we want to count the number of states, we are saying, well, basically the number of states, this is all we need in order to describe the number of states. Why? Because remember what our counting procedure is, what is the pool of the total particles, the big box, okay, and what are the small boxes? The small box, the big box is the total number of particles, the small boxes are x plus, nx plus, nx minus, ny plus, ny minus. So the number of states is n prime divided by n x factorial and x plus factorial n x minus factorial uh, it's a multinomial fact uh, n y plus factorial n y minus factorial okay so the total is number of particles n. I'm choosing to the nx and nx plus, nx minus, ny plus, ny minus, and I don't care about the order how I chose all those particles. Okay, but there is a problem with this because 
when we are used to solve things, we used to describe everything by maybe some physical properties. So what are the physical properties of the system? The physical properties of the system is the energy. Okay. I want to use the energy. And since my goal over here is to describe something about elastic models, I need to describe the system not as the number of particles, nx plus, ny plus, blah, blah, blah. I want to describe this as a function of the length of the, no, of the monomer, of the polymer in the x direction, and the length of the polymer in the y direction. I'm pulling uh, the y direction. I won't, it won't matter eventually because I'm constraining the system to be zero in the y direction, and I'm pulling only in the x direction. But I want this property inside the number of states because when I will start and, uh, and, and describe that the entropy is the log of the number of states multiplied by k Boltzmann, I don't want to obtain a formula that includes nx plus and y minus. I want to obtain a, a formula that includes the number of particles, which is OK, the length of the, moly, of the polymer, the width of the polymer, and the energy of the polymer. Okay? Those are the important quantities for me. The, the number of particles, the size, and the energy. So we need to switch those parameters over here. Okay? How we switch them? We say the following things. So first of all, we write our constraints. So first of all, nx plus, plus nx minus, plus ny plus, plus ny minus equals n. This is equation number one. What else do we have? We have that nx plus minus nx minus. This is Lx divided by A. A, let's write it down over here. A is the size of single of a single monomer. Okay. So what is this size in the x direction? Is how many particles are to the right minus the number of particles to the left, and this is the total length in the x direction. The same I can say about the y direction. Ny plus minus Ny minus equals to Ly divided by A. Instead of dragging this A everywhere with me, I will say this is simply Lx prime, and this is simply Ly prime. Okay. And I also have an additional equation, which is the energy of the system, right? I can also describe the energy of the system, which is simply the total number of particles which are pointing in the y direction, or the minus y direction. Okay. So n a y plus plus n y minus equals multiplied by epsilon multi equals to u. I would write it down as n y plus plus n y minus equals to u divided by epsilon, and will instead of dragging this epsilon all the way with me, I will say it's just u prime. So, I here have one, two, three, four equations. Okay. In these four equations, in these four equations, I can have, and I will substitute all instead of n x plus, n x minus, n y plus, n y minus. I will use, I will use n. Lx prime, Ly prime, U prime. I can always solve it, and I can always make this substitution. It's a linear system. Uh, so it's always, we are always capable of doing it. Okay, so instead of solving those four equations, I will write you down what, what is the result is. So we say that Nx plus equals to 1 half N minus U prime plus Lx prime and x minus equals to one half n minus u prime minus lx prime. Okay. We have ny plus equals to 
one half u prime plus ly prime, and we have ny minus ny minus, right, equals one half u prime minus ly prime. Okay, so now we can write finally the number of states of this polymer model by using the quantities that we want to describe the physics with. The biggest problem with that is that this formula is awful. It's really, really awful. Okay. And what is this? We say we take those formulas over here and we substitute them into it there. So omega is n prime divided by one half n minus u prime plus lx prime factorial multiplied by one half n minus u prime minus lx prime factorial multiplied by one half u prime plus ly prime factorial multiplied by one half u prime minus ly prime factorial. Now this is really, really ugly and it becomes even more ugly when we say, well, what is S divided by K Boltzmann? Okay. So let's write it down. It is n log n minus n uh, minus one half of n minus u prime plus. I use the staring approximation over here. Staring. And s is equals to k Boltzmann log omega minus l or plus Lx prime multiplied by log of one half n minus u prime plus Lx prime. Okay, we still have here plus one half n minus u prime plus Lx prime. We continue this horror. We have minus one half n minus u prime minus Lx prime log of one half n minus u prime minus lx prime plus one half n minus u prime minus lx prime minus so we done with this term we've done with this term we're now in this term so it's minus one half u prime plus ly prime multiplied by a log of a one half u prime plus ly prime plus one half u prime plus ly prime. So we're done with this term. And the last one is minus one half u prime minus ly prime multiplied by log of one half u prime minus ly prime and finally plus one half of u prime minus ly prime. Fantastic formula that we now need to take a derivative off and do something with it. Okay? Um, this is the problem with microeconomical ensemble. So even when you have done counting and it becomes harder and harder to count stuff, the formulas are becoming longer and longer and longer. Okay, so okay, we can use program like in Mathematica, push everything inside, take the derivative, uh, ask it to simplify things. Right. So nowadays we can do it fast enough, but even even Mathematica have limits, right? Uh, uh, although Wolfram says it doesn't, but it has limits. This basically shows that this approach is not good enough for large systems. It becomes something like that. Um, okay, so I write you down, instead of 
taking all these long derivatives, I will write you down what exactly the formula at the end is, which is not so bad. So, because the next step will be, the next step will be to take the derivative, right? Because I want to define one p equals to ds to du. I have to take the derivative this guy with respect to u. Some of the terms are simple, like this terms, but there's a lot of u divided by one over u, and etc., etc. U. It's not that complicated, but it's long. That's it. uh, so we take this guy over here, and we obtain the following equation. So, questions? Here? No, one line up. One line up, yes. It's a plus. Ah, uh, plus, thank you. <laughs> thank you, it's a plus, then here it's a, ah, uh, it's a plus. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Now it all makes sense. Okay, uh, <laughs> of course. Okay, so the first derivative is as follows. I can take one t over ds du. I have to take all of these guys over there. Um, I spare you the problem and eventually say that after I am doing all the mass from this equation, one obtains in exactly the same fashion as we did in for the Einstein model and the two-state model. It's, it's the same math. It's just long. Uh, so we have e to the power of 2 epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t equals to n minus u prime squared minus Lx prime squared divided by u prime squared. Okay, this is equation number one. Now let's do something that we haven't done before because previously we only had the energy, the temperature, the number of particles. Here we have additional stuff, right? We have this Lx prime and Ly prime and specifically we're interested in the Lx prime behavior. So let's see what we are doing with those terms. So let's just remember this equation. I haven't showed you the explicit map, but please forgive me for not taking all the derivatives over here on the board. This board is too small for that. OK. The second derivative, or the second equation, falls from the following thing. So we know, if we have energy E, we know, we have shown it, it's part of the first and second thermodynamic laws, that D is TDS plus tau Y D L Y plus tau X D L X. Right. Remember the energies. There are some generalized forces. Temperature is a generalized force for the entropy. If we are take, saying something about tension and length, they're coupled. So the tension multiplied by the length, this is the work in the y direction. And the tension in the x direction multiplied by Lx, dLx, is the work in the in the x direction. Okay, so let's turn it around a little bit and we'll say that ds equals 1 over t d minus tau y divided by t dl y minus tau x divided by t dl x. Okay, now from this equation over here, what we obtain, so what stands over here? ds, all those prefactors are the partial derivatives. So ds dl x equals to what is standing in front of dl x over here. It's simply minus tau x divided by t. Okay. My tau x is the force that I'm pulling on this 
polymer over here. This is my tau x. I don't have tau y, okay? And my L y is basically eventually is going to be zero. But I do have tau x because I'm pushing here. This is my tau x. Okay. This is the force that I'm using. So we can take this nightmare over here, take her derivative with respect to Lx. Remember, Lx prime is simply Lx divided by A. Okay? We can take this nightmare over here, write down this equation, okay? and obtain an additional equation for those values over here. What is this additional equation? I will write, I will write it down for you, because again, the derivatives are simply too long. So the second equation is e to the power minus 2 tau x a divided by k Boltzmann t. This a appeared over here because the derivative with respect to lx and not lx prime. Okay? And remember, lx divided by a is lx prime. Okay? This is why a appears over here. So it equals to n minus u prime minus lx prime divided by n minus u prime plus lx prime. Okay, so this is equation number two. What I can do next, next thing is I can basically get rid of u over here. I have n u prime u prime lx prime lx prime. I have n u prime lx prime. Epsilon is the basic energy, I know it. K bolt 20 I also know that I have the temperature. But I can get, get rid of the energy from the two equations. Okay. I can basically say I can basically say the following. From this equation, I obtain that e to the minus 2 tau x a divided by k bolts on t, multiplied by n, minus u prime, multiplied by e to the power, minus 2 tau x a, divided by k bolts on t, minus, or, sorry, plus lx prime, multiplied by e to the power, minus 2 tau x a, divided by k bolts on t, equals to what? It equals to n minus u prime minus lx prime. Okay. So, okay, so we go over here and we say that uh, u prime of e to the power minus 2 tau x a divided by k Boltzmann t minus 1 equals to it equals to whatever is left, and whatever is left is um, n multiplied by e minus 2 tau x a k Boltzmann t minus 1. So we take this term and drag it to the left. Um, and we also have plus lx prime multiplied by e to the power minus 2 tau x a divided by k Boltzmann t plus 1, okay? And we finally obtain that u prime is uh, n plus lx prime 1 plus, right, so e to the minus 2 tau x a by k Boltzmann t plus 1 divided by 
e to the power minus 2 tau x a k Boltzmann t minus 1. This is u. Now, afterwards, we can make a substitution of this into this equation. We can substitute the u prime into e to the power 2 epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t equals n minus u prime squared minus lx prime squared divided by u prime squared. Okay. We can substitute u over there and after some massage of this equation what we obtain is that lx prime divided by n equals to hyperbolic sinus of tau x a divided by k Boltzmann t divided by hyperbolic cosine of tau x a divided by k Boltzmann t plus e minus epsilon k Boltzmann t. Why we needed to get this guy over here? Right? Why we actually take two derivatives of the entropy, one with respect to the energy, the other one with respect to the length, and afterwards play with it, substitute one equation into another, because look, eventually we are, le we are left with the equation that is the pe for Lx prime, that depends on the temperature and on the force. Okay. And this is our elastic modulus. What is an elastic modulus? Elastic modulus is how the length of the polymer or any system changes with the temperature or the derivative of the length when, when, it's, when a, a specific force is applied, okay, how it changes with the temperature. Okay, let's look on this guy. The elastic modulus is dLx by d tau x. Okay. This is the elastic modulus. Why it's an elastic modulus? Well, basically because we know that the expansion is proportional for elastic systems. The expansion or the force is proportional to the length, right? So if the expansion is proportional to the length, the prefactor is the modulus, right? If it's a linear. And as we said, for elastic systems, this guy is basically growth as a function of the temperature. The system expands more. It's easier to stretch it as the temperature goes for elastic system. What happens for our guys? Uh, we have this guy over here. So in general, what we need to do, we need to take the derivative of this ugly thing over there with respect to the tau x. Um, let's not do it. Okay. Why? Because it's, it's ugly and actually, it's, you know, we won't see the physics. Let's look when actually going into this uh, elastic regime. What is an elastic regime? If I take this particle and I push on it a little bit or stretch it a little bit, the response is going to be elastic as long as my force is not too large. Because if my force is very, very lar large, I will crush this pencil and there is no elastic response whatsoever. So all this elastic theory works only in the limit when the forces are small. If I'm pushing too hard on the system, it's not elastic response. I'm starting to crush the, the, the molecules and the bonds, right? So I actually want to take the limit of small tension, and basically tau x multiplied by L is small. Okay. The tension is small enough. The work that I have done is not big. 
Now, when I'm taking this limit, this guy over here becomes much more simplified, right? Because I can take the hyperbolic sign and I can take the hyperbolic cosine, which simply uh, functions of exponentials, okay? Make a small expansion because then this guy is small and this guy is small. I don't know nothing about this part. And when I take this limit, Lx is simply tau x multiplied by n a squared divided by k Boltzmann t multiplied by 1 plus e to the minus epsilon divided by k Boltzmann t, power of minus 1. Okay. So what is my elastic modulus? You see the response is linear. Okay. It's linear with the force. My elastic modulus is simply this term over here. Like in rigor elasticity, right? I apply a small force, and the length is small. I apply a large force, the length is large, but it breaks somewhere in between. So we do not, we cannot simply apply large force. So our elastic modulus dLx to d tau x is n a squared divided by k Boltzmann t multiplied by 1 plus e to the power minus k Boltzmann t minus 1. What is going on over here? We increase our temperature. We increase our temperature. This guy over here is going to a constant. So it's basically this prefactor does not matter. What is important when we increase the temperature? What is the major factor over here? It's this one. 1 over t. Okay. 1 over t. So the higher the temperature, the smaller the prefactor 1 over t is, the smaller is the elastic modulus. What it means? I apply the force at temperature t, I am getting an expansion a. I increase my temperature, I am applying the same force, and I'm getting a fraction of the previous expansion. Okay? I'm actually, I need, I, I, a larger force is needed for higher temperatures in order to expand the same system for the same length. This is an opposite of an elastic behavior. For a regular elastic behavior, I increase the temperature about a spring. Heat it up, it's much more easier to, to expand it. Cool it down, it's much more harder. It's the opposite way over here, where this, this behavior came from. So those are what we call an entropic force. There are no opposing forces. There are no forces, actual forces, that are becoming larger because, because I increase the temperature. It's not that I included any force over there, and I increased the temperature, and there was a dependence of this force with the temperature, and it becomes it actually squeezed the system together. Right? When we think about a spring, so the molecules are, uh, there are small springs between the molecules, and I increase or decrease the temperature, it's the same spring over there. It's just they are rotating a little bit more, vibrating a little bit more. Now, I haven't included any forces that become larger as I increase the temperature. Okay, so from the forces perspective, this is a bad result, right? I had exactly the same forces. I increase the temperature. The forces do not depend on the temperature whatsoever, right? But the elastic modulus became smaller. Something fishy about it. But this is fishy smell comes only due to the fact if you forget about the number of states and you forget about entropy. Because what actually happens as I increase the temperature? As I increase the temperature, all those particles, all those monomers over here that can be excited into the higher state, basically, they can be stretched in the y direction. There are much more possibilities now. Okay? It's much more easier for those small monomers, instead of being only in the one-dimensional system, they can now turn up or in this direction, and the system becomes much more expanded in the y direction. So we do not have a one-dimensional system anymore. Because of the entropy and the temperature, there are much more expansion 
in the, in the y direction. So in order to pull this guy now, it's much more harder because what I mean by pulling, I need to stretch everybody. But much more guys now are in the perpendicular direction to the stretching direction. So it becomes much more harder. Okay? This is the result that we obtain. This is an entropical force. It comes only due to the fact that we were provided much more opportunity for the system to expand in the second dimension. And it's now you're trying to pull it out of the second dimension. And it's hard because much more particles are in the second dimension instead of being only in the one dimension over here. <coughs> so we gain this from very, this very simplification. This is, this is well, the, the beauty of physics. You sometimes you forget about a lot of stuff, but you're still getting this feeling that something still worked. And something about this polymer is only about the dimensionality and how you allow the polymer to explore this dimensionality. And nothing more. Okay? We, this result, you can maybe get it a little bit more precise, right? By the, by the effective part that Increasing as the temperature goes up, it only depends on the dimensionality and that the number of states grows as you increase your temperature. That's it. Um, so this was the last model about uh, microcanonical ensemble. We see the problems of this microcanonical ensemble. There are two major problems. One problem is the counting process. So we only had few boxes and a lot of particles, and we don't really care how we put these particles in those boxes. It was very simple. But when the system becomes more constrained, more correlated, it becomes basically an impossible to do the counting. The second hard work was after, after we got all those numbering, all those number of states, we got those Horrible long equations due to the sterling approximation, and we had to do, uh, do something with them, and it's also not a good thing. Um, so in the next lecture, I'm at least I'm not going to solve any new models. I'm I even won't show you a way how you deal with those long uh, derivatives because there is no easy way. The only easy way is actually to go to the canonical ensemble where the derivatives are simple and their representation is simple. But the counting process can actually, may be, be, uh, can actually be uh, much more simpler. And this is what we talk, we will uh, a little bit uh, touch this uh, subject in the next uh, 45 minutes. What we are going to do now um, is to look on an alternative description of the counting process for the Einstein model. Now, remember in the Einstein model, and this will actually also show you what is the problem with our, with the microscope, microcanonical ensemble, and maybe how one can fix it a little bit. So, in the Einstein model, eventually we are counting different states or different particles. So, we had only two particles, or two oscillators. There are our quantum numbers, and x, and n y or what split and y and n x. Right? No, I prefer n x and n y. Um, okay. Now the n x and n y they are the occupation numbers. They say or they represent what is the energy of the oscillator. Remember the total energy per oscillator E was n h bar omega zero. So we can say what is the energy of a given oscillator instead of saying, well, it has to be n multiplied by h bar omega zero, everything is dictated by the quantum number of this given oscillator. Okay. The same goes for all the other different oscillators. So a single oscillator can have n, which is equal to zero, one, two, three, four, Etc. 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 Five, an integer number. The same goes for any other oscillator. It can have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. 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 Okay. Um. 
So any oscillator can have an integer number of or a quantum, an integer quantum number. Now, when you're saying that the total energy of the system is u, it basically means that u equals to an x h bar omega zero plus n y h bar omega zero, or u divided by h bar omega zero equals to n x plus n y. It's a line, right? So if we write n x as a function of n y, it's a line that starts with our maximal energy. And it goes to the same energy over here. So our counting process, remember what was the counting process? We counted the number of states of the total system under the constraint that the energy is constant, u. So what we actually counted? We counted what is the number of different states that satisfy this equation. What are the number of different n-axes and n-y's that satisfy this equation? So we look on all the different possible states over here, which we simply plot as a dot in our two-dimensional graph. And we say the counting process is we have a two-dimensional spread of those points. We choose a line that, that is crossing our, this, uh, this uh, two-dimensional manifold, right? And we only count these points that are on our line. Now, for a given energy, U, we have not a chance that it will catch a lot of different energies uh, or all different states. Because let's say that we have a general energy that near this U, but you know, in the vicinity, but not exactly on this line. Okay? So the number of states, the number of states over here, the number of states for this additional U is zero because we haven't managed to cross any point in our two-dimensional manifold, right? So this is a problem with the counting process, right? And we can make this uh, harder and harder. So the thing is that we need to choose very precise and very specific Q because of all those integer conditions. Um, now, this is not good, I mean, not mathematically, but actually physically, because in physics, we cannot describe or we cannot say what is exactly the energy of the system. We always have some sort of uncertainty. Right? There is quantum mechanical description of the system that we don't know, really know what is the energy of the system. B, there is always some small interactions, some small fluctuations. And those fluctuations also make those, this uncertainty a little bit bigger. So we don't really know what our energy, what is our, what is the energy of the system. Now, if we perform this counting procedure, we can fold that on our bag because maybe we're counting for an energy that's basically providing us a zero answer. So in order to solve this problem a little bit, right, what we actually can do, instead of counting all the number of states that is provided by one single energy, we can say, let's look on the number of states that lies in some vicinity of the energy. Okay? We look on the number of states that lies between the energy of U, U, and the energy of U minus delta. Okay? So there is a some shallow or some you know, narrow skin near this line, there is this boarding line, and we count the, pro the number of states that not exactly on the line, but is, you know, in small vicinity delta of this border line. Border line. Okay. So, how it actually helps me? Now, what I'm claiming is that the number of states in this delta vicinity is proportional to the area of this delta vicinity. How so? Okay, so if we look 
on our plot again, so this is nx, and this is ny, and we have a line over here. Okay. So each state can be represented by a small area around this state. Okay. So basically what we can do in order to count the number of states that lies below a given line, instead of counting the states, right, what we can do, we can actually calculate the area under this plot. Now, since the area is proportional to the number of small areas, right, what I'm saying is by calculating the area under the plot, right, is exactly as counting the total number of states that have an energy lower than u. Take u divided by h bar minus 0 equals nx plus ny. Okay. So there is a strict connection between the area in this configurational space and the total number of states. Right? Now, if I continue with this line of reasoning, I'm saying, what is the number of states in, in this delta vicinity? It's proportional, it's basically given by the area of this delta vicinity borderline. Right? So how I'm going to con compute it? I can say, let's compute the total number of states with energy lower than u, so all this area over here, minus, minus the area of, or minus the total number of states that are with the energy that is lower than u minus delta. Each time, I need only to compute an area, right? So, instead of starting to count stuff, I need to count, or not to count, I need to integrate over specific regions. So, I will say that u hat of omega hat of u is the number of states with energy smaller than u. And basically, u minus delta is number of states with energy smaller than u minus delta. Now, if I want to count the number of states in the vicinity of u, in the delta vicinity of u, I will say that it's simply the total number of states with energy smaller than u minus the total number of states with the energy smaller than u minus delta. Okay? And since the total number of states is simply the area, so I need to compute the area under the plot of u, I need to compute the area under the plot of u minus delta, and I need to subtract between them, make a subtraction of one from another, and I will get the number of states that I'm looking for. Okay, so instead of counting, I will try to integrate, because this is the way how I compute areas. So, let us try, and for this Einstein model, try and obtain the formula of u of delta hat of u. Now, if I had only one particle, or one oscillator, okay, for n equals 1, what is omega hat of u. Okay. So this is the number of states that is smaller than u. So it's simply 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. It's simply u divided by h bar omega 0. Okay. I'm not including the same the state of u. I'm including only the states that are smaller than u. And the number of states is the total number or the maximal nx that I can get. Okay. 
Okay, it's the maximum nx that I can get. It's u divided by uh, h bar omega zero. All right. What happens? Why is it for n equal one? Okay. No, I want to compute omega n equals one. I want to compute omega general n. I want to compute what is the total number of states for n particles. Why this formula holds is think about the following. So the, to the, 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 the energy of the system is u. So nx max equals to what? u divided by h bar omega zero, right? So if I have only one particle and I know that the energy of the system is u, I know what is the quantum number of this particle. It's simply the energy divided by the quantum of the energy h bar omega zero, right? Now, the number of states below this energy is all the different quantum numbers that I can get. I can get one, I can get uh, zero, I can get two, etc., etc. It's not the state of the energy because the state of the system with this given energy is provided by this nx max. But the total number of states or the area that I want to compute is proportional to what is the number of, of states on this line over here. And this is simply u, divi u divided by h bar omega zero. Let's do it for n exposed to. So what happens if I have two particles? I need to perform an integration, omega 2 of u. I need to perform an integration of the total number of n x or n x and the total number of n y. Now, nx, this is the integration of this guy, right? nx, ny. And this line is u divided by h bar omega 0. So, if ny changes between 0, this is the difference, from 0 till u divided by h bar omega 0, Okay. This is integration over n y, and x can change only till zero and what? Remember, u divided by h bar omega zero equals n x plus n y. Okay, so n x is greater than zero, and n x is smaller by from u divided by h bar omega zero minus n y. Okay, so the integration over here is u divided by h bar omega zero minus n. This is our integral over here. Okay, so how we perform this integration? omega 2 of u. So the integration, the total number of states, is the integration of ny we, we still do not perform. So this is integration of u h bar omega 0. And here we have an integral from 0 to the integral over nx between 0 and till u divided by h bar omega 0 minus ny. It's simply u divided by h bar omega 0 minus ny. Here we have still d and y. Okay. Let's take this uh, integration again. And it is 1 over 2 u divided by h bar omega 0 minus n y squared. And we have here a minus 1. Okay. Between n y changes between 0 and u divided by h bar omega 0 which gives us 1 over 2 u divided by h bar omega 0 squared. So this is omega 2 of 
you. Okay, we will continue and we'll continue into the if we have three particles, okay, three oscillators. What is the total number of states for three oscillators, all right? For three oscillators, if the if we count the number of the states below some given energy u. So what we do over here, first we remember that u divided by h bar omega zero, we will have nx plus ny plus nz. Right? So this omega hat of u, it's an integration, threefold integration over dnx, dny, and dnz. Nz will change between zero and u divided by h bar omega zero. Okay. This guy, dnx, will change between zero and u divided by h bar omega zero minus n y minus n z. Okay. What is going to be the change in NY? It's going to be between 0 and U divided by H bar omega 0 minus NZ. Okay. This is, so first we integrate over DNX. NX, is, this is the, the, the ranges here are simple. DNX can be changed between what? Between 0, it's always greater than 0, and the total energy. The total energy depends on what is the states of n, y and, 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 and z. After we integrate it, we only left with two terms, n, n, y, and n, z. So we do the same thing again. n, y can change between 0 and till the maximal energy level. What is the maximal energy level for a given an x? It's u divided by h bar z, omega 0 minus n, z. And then we do the same trick again. Okay, so let's write it down. So it equals to an integral, an integral of u divided by h bar omega 0 minus n y minus n z dn y dn z n z changes between 0 and u divided by h bar omega 0, okay. and n y changes between 0 and u divided by h bar omega 0 minus n z. Okay, we perform this additional integral, and it's given, it gives us an integral over u over from 0 till u divided, u divided by h bar omega 0. This integral over here is simply uh, minus 1 divided by 2 u divided by h bar omega 0 minus n z okay, minus n z squared d n z Because by maxima, ny cannot be larger than u divided by h bar omega 0 minus nz. Because it, well, if it was the case, an nx should be larger than whatever it was. Okay. Uh, there is no minus 1 over here. Right, it's just one half. Okay. We do this integration again. And we obtain that it equals omega 3 hat of u equals to 1 over 6, okay, u divided by h bar omega 0 to 3, to the power of 3, okay? We can continue and prove by induction that if we had n particles, the total number of states for n particles below a given energy u u divided by h bar omega 0 equals to 1 over n factorial 
u divided by h bar omega 0 to the power of n. How we prove it? Simply by induction. We can continue this argument over here. It's a long integral. One integral gives, gives each integral is just providing terms that looks like this or this. So it's a pretty simple proof. Right? Now, where we are going with that? So if this is true for un, we can write down over here what is the total number, because we haven't assumed anything about u, right? So it's actually a few. So what is un of u minus delta? We just need to substitute, instead of u, u minus delta in this formula. This is 1 over n factorial u minus delta divided by h bar omega 0 to the power of n. Okay. Now, let's do this calculation. We know that the total number of states, not the total, the number of states in the delta vicinity, okay, in the delta vicinity of u, equals to omega hat of u minus omega hat of u minus delta. So we need to subtract those two terms, one from each other, and we know explicitly what are the terms. So we have equals to 1 over n factorial u divided by h bar omega 0 to the power of n minus 1 n factorial u divided by h bar omega 0. Here we have minus delta to the power of n. Let's take out what term we're going to take out. We're going to take out this 1 over n factorial u divided by h bar omega 0 to the power of n. Here we have 1 minus what we are left with. So we have taken outside u divided by h bar omega 0. Okay? So it's 1 minus? 1 minus delta divided by u to the power of n. Okay. This is the number of states that we were looking for. Okay? Now, the thing is, so we have this term, we have this addition. Now the thing is that we are only dealing with high dimensionality, large number of particles, macroscopical systems, so n goes to infinity. In any delta, delta is small, u can be large or small, it doesn't matter, 1 minus delta divided by u is smaller than 1, and it's larger than 0. So in the limit, when n goes to infinity, in the limit of n goes to infinity, we obtain that omega of u equals 1 over n factorial u divided by h bar omega 0 to the power of n. This result is different from the result that we obtain when explicitly counting all the different states. We look back on the Einstein model, we had something else over there, right? Now, the thing is that in this limit, limit of n goes to infinity, in this limit, you take this result, okay? And you take the other result. Uh, you use both of them in order to define what is the entropy, because the entropy S k Boltzmann log of omega u, Um, you start to define what is the temperature, what is the equation of state, and you will get exactly the same result using this equation or the equation that we got over there. 
the result is going to be exactly the same. Why? Because of all the derivatives in the middle. All different terms that will depend on n, n plus 1, n minus 1, etc., 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 they will all disappear only because of the derivatives. So there are differences between the number of states and there are differences between the entropies. But the state functions are the derivatives of the entropy. They are not the entropy the, itself. Right? So what will, is going to happen is the behavior of S with U and the behavior of S with N and etc. etc. It won't make a damn thing to take this formula or the actual formula. But again, only in this limit of n goes to infinity. Now, what it means, it means that at least for the Einstein model, we don't have to work really hard. Okay? Whatever we have done before, we could have done way, 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 um, go to, uh, along a much more easier path. Uh, Is this tr a true statement for any given system? Okay, because one of the difficulties of the microcanonical model that we don't really know how to count. And here I introducing to you, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a path that well you don't need to count. You need to perform integrations, and eventually in those integrations are much more simpler. Right. So the truth is that there is a general claim that I will describe to you in a moment. And this claim is that for high enough temperatures and large enough systems, well, macroscopical systems, this way of thinking always works. Right? You can always count different areas, not count, you can calculate different areas, and you can subtract between them. Okay? You can subtract between them, and you will obtain a result that is a plausible result. The problem is that this result will fail when the number of your ingredients is small or your temperature is small. Why? Because when your temperature is small, you don't have a large space to actually to integrate over. Your space is small. Your system is centralized somewhere in a very low number of ends. And then you still have to count. Right? But when you do not have to count, you're in a very large space, very high temperatures, this is okay. Now, one thing to notice over here is, look, the number of states in the delta vicinity, in the delta vicinity of U, uh, yes, but uh, this is not what I wanted to say, is exactly the number of states not in the delta vicinity, right? But actually, it's the whole space. Look what I have done. I said, I'm only looking on this delta vicinity, okay? I'm integrating in up to u, I'm integrating up to u minus delta, I'm subtracting, okay, and there is, uh, well, I expect that there is a small surface, right? So that what I do expect is that the number of terms in the volume is going to be much, much, much larger than the number of states or the area of the surface around this volume. And what I have obtained is actually that the number of states or the volume of the surface, delta surface, is exactly the same as the volume in the large end limit, is exactly the same as the volume of the whole system. Okay? So this is a not trivial fact. I think about it is that you have a potato, and all the potato is not inside, but actually on, on, <coughs> on the boundary. Right. So, it only appears for high dimensionality. So if we, and, and since we used to one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, our intuition is, is not going well for this end going to infinity limit. It's a topological fact. Is when we integrate in three dimensional space, we know that the volume inside a cube is much, much larger than the volume near the surface. But it's not true when n is infinite. Okay? It's not true that when n is infinite. So basically, basically, what this method is saying, it even simplifies more the counting process. Because what the method is saying is, when you, what you need actually to count is not the number of states in the vicinity, but you need to count the total number of states up to a given energy. And this is much more in, uh, easier, usually. 
And the general claim is that for high enough temperatures, it will be sufficient, okay? Exactly like in the Einstein model. And here, one can provide um, simple geometrical reasoning. Okay? So what is the geometrical reasoning? Not to count, but to integrate, and actually to integrate up to a given energy, and not to care about the delta vicinity. Okay. What is the geometrical reasoning? Geometrical topological. So let's assume that we are in dimension, in n dimensional space. Okay. The volume in this n dimensional space, the volume of a cube, the volume of a sphere, for example, is the radius of the sphere to some power n. And here we will have a prefactor that is dependent on the dimensionality, um, but it's uh, some numeric number, right? Some, it has numeric form. It does not depend on R, okay? So this is the volume in dimension N for a sphere, okay? Now, let's compute what is dV divided by V. So I change the radius of my sphere a little bit, and I want to see how the volume changed a little bit, or more preci uh, precisely, I want to change on the fraction of how the volume has changed with respect to the total volume, right? So this is simply dv to dr multiplied by dr divided by dv. I'm sorry, by v. Now, so dv divided by v equals to, what is dv divided by uh, dv dr? Is simply n, a n, r to the power of n minus 1, right? Multiplied by dr, divided by, instead of v, let us write here, a n multiplied by r n, okay? So what we obtain, eventually, we obtain that dv divided by v equals to n dr divided by r. Okay. Now, let's, that looks okay, this uh, differential uh, kind of calculation. Um, but what is this okay? when n is of the order of the Avogadro number. n goes to 10 to the power of 24. Okay. Let's assume, let's assume okay, that we change the radius, we change the radius by some small fraction. So, Let's assume that dr divided by r is 0.01, okay? Or even 10 to the minus 3. If I want to do a numerical calculation of the volume or of the surface, this is the small change in the radius, okay? This is for most numerical calculations, it's sufficient. That's good, right? I change it slightly, slightly with respect to the total radius of the system, okay? Uh, what is dv divided by v is going to be? Going to be, according to this calculation, 10 to the 24 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3, which goes as 10 to the 21. I change my radius slightly and the total number of states that was in the small surface around the radius, so think about it. This was my surface with radius r, with radius r, and I added to this small proportion of dr. Now this dr is really small with respect to r. 
So the dv divided by v is the total number of states over here divided by the total states over there. Now think about it that this is actually really, really, really small. Okay. And I obtained that there was a huge jump, okay, because what I obtained is that dv equals to 10 to the 21 multiplied by v. The number of states exploded, simply exploded. The total number of states over here is much, much, much larger than the total number of states over there, although their volumes are different. The radius are smaller. This is an interesting fact. And basically, it says that the differential calculation like this one simply fails when there are divergencies, when there are large dimensionalities. Our intuition is failing us. Right? And this is why, this is why we can go and instead of counting the number in the small vicinity, we can actually count the total number up to a given energy. We don't care because in any case, all the states, or most of the states, are in the vicinity of the surface. So we can use this technique, go back to the three models that we used. We've already seen that in Einstein case it works, but it always will work uh, also for the other systems. When n is large, we can apply to the polymer and obtain the entropy formula, which will look much nicer than the horrible stuff that we had in the previous lecture. Uh, the same goes for the two-state model, right? So the calculation or um, the calculation of the number of states can be simplified, really, really simplified. But it will start to fail when the temperature is low, because then there is a lot of constraints and we're not integrating over a large surface. We're integrating over something which is very constrained. This argument falls down and won't work anymore. So one can say, well, you can always solve the microcanonical uh, ensemble or the using microcanonical formalism, any model, for large number of particles and high enough temperatures. Yes, but this is simple, right? This is not something interesting because basically when the temperature is high enough, you're assuming that the particles are uncorrelated and this stuff works, right? But the interesting behavior, it's usually in the lower temperatures when things start to interact with each other. There's interesting like phase transitions start to occur. Otherwise, well, it's like a gas in some sense. Um, on this note, uh, we will we are done with the microcanonical ensemble. We will use it as a first step to describe canonical and grand canonical ensembles. Um, but we will continue with this in the next, next lecture.